Hi there, I'm Mark Hobson. Um, I'm a professional artist and uh, we're going to have a quick look at my studio space which has been on this location for 30 years and uh, I look forward to sharing that with you. This video is sponsored by Hulkman. The Hulkman Jumpstarter is a portable jumpstarter that can get you out of a sticky situation with data from over 500 gas engine vehicles from over 20 brands under normal operating temperatures around 72 degrees Fahrenheit shows that Hulkman Jumpstarters have a 99.9% .9 jump start success rate. There's only three steps to use the jumpstarter. It's very intuitive. Just connect it to your battery, wait for it to say ready and start your engine. Get a Hulkman Jumpstarter before you need it and use our link in the description and get 20% off when you order today. I came to Tofino with the idea that I'd be an artist. So I would bought a little house in Tofino back in the days when you could afford houses. Everybody I knew wanted to come and visit. I used to teach high school for 10 years. I used to be a very avid member of <laughs> UVic's Outdoor Club and I had tons of friends from all my years as a National Park uh, employee. Actually, I remember the day when I, I think I squeezed out paint eight different times and never actually touched a paintbrush to the canvas. So I began to realize that the only way to get anything done, I would um, I would need to find an alternative and I couldn't afford a piece of land. But when this float house was available, I, I jumped on it. So that was August of 1991. At the beginning, it was just a little flat box and very dark and I sit with a headlamp and it was really not the best place to make a, a studio space. I, scrounged bits of windows from places. In the two summers of 2005 and 2006, we extended the decking and then hired these two young guys. And the three of us uh, basically built the second floor, which is where we're sitting right now. I feel embedded in, in the world that I love to paint. And the area immediately around this bay is part of the Cloquiat Tribal Park. I've been blessed by um, ha having their blessing <laughs> to be here. Uh, one of the things they're quite happy with is all the note keeping that I do and that, that ties in very closely with their stewardship program. This area has been, you know, I just keep documenting it and that's, it's been a really huge part of the, the joy of being here. It's, and the more you write, the more you keep track, the more you notice and uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. The only thing that was bought new were the joists for the ceiling here. Everything else has been scrounged. Um, and the original cost of the float house, I bought it for 12000 You know, I spent up to, I think it was $19,000 to do the second floor. And then it's just been adding on, yeah. It was just a little flat box with 18 inch decks around the corner of it. And the front deck was a bit longer, but the whole front corner had lost its flotation, was underwater. So that was a kind of a priority. It was to get some barrels of air underneath there and lift that up. 2005 was spent getting the decks widened up. So essentially I was building a great big pad like a big snowshoe so that if we did put the second floor up, it, it's got more foundation. And it also means I can add more flotation around the edges. We're attached to shore in quite a few places. There's actually 10 ropes. I put metal pins in each corner early on when I was here. They held well for a while, but uh, two of them have broken off since, so I've been wrapping around rocks and that seems to be better. Everybody needs a woodshed in this world if you're using wood for heat. The original core of it was part of the original dock at Tofino where you get gas, owned by Whitey Bernard. I fill it up as best I can, usually in May. By the time I get to um, good old November when it starts to rain. I'll just use one or two pieces to get the fire started and then I've become quite an expert at operating with, with wet wood. As I need it, I, I top it up. At the very beginning, there was no siding. It was just tar paper and there was a, a hotel on uh, Stubbs Island and the windows are from that, that hotel. They're not thermal panes by any means, but it's nice to you know keep that history going on. On this side of the building, we've got the staircase. My dad's an engineer and he came out here and he built the two staircases, the one on the inside and this one, and he just loves this kind of project. Well, this little room became a bathroom. It's not very big, but it serves the purpose. And uh, once I built the little bathroom, there was this little extension. I thought, oh gosh, that'll be perfect for a workbench. And with a corrugated roof, it gives a lot of light. The only problem is with a big, heavy dump of snow off the upper roof, it's cracked a few times and I've had to replace it. But uh, usually the rain washes the snow away before it comes crashing down and breaks through the roof. So this little tool cabinet here, handy to have it near the workshop. And we have a cabinet here. This has got all the stainless steel screws and all the things you want to keep, keep 
keep from getting rusted but that just just locked it in there so that's just a and there's lights here so at night i can work on the you know, some little project and and night starts at 4 30 in the middle of january so having a light a lighted area to do a little repair or two is really handy used to just collect rainwater and garbage cans once i got the second floor and i set these these barrels up on the eaves i didn't realize of course if the stove is on the smoke um, creates smoky tasting water, which is, you know, okay on a camping trip once in a while. But if you don't have to have smoky tasting water, I decided I would dream this little system up. So this little valve, um, when it's perpendicular, the rainwater comes right off the roof and goes straight down. It doesn't bother being collected. I collect it only when the stove is on. So I'll have a really heavy rainy morning or something. I decide, well, I won't light the wood stove till I filled up all my barrels. And then I just turn that that way and the water hits here and goes in this way and then drains that way. So it's, yeah, it's pretty simple, but uh, it's a great little effective system. I have these two gulls that are really, really very friendly through the winter and they spend hours and hours here and their favorite place to sit was on the roof. So I ended up um, just putting a, a wire. If you ever are collecting water off a metal roof and there's seagulls around or crows, probably a good idea to, to keep them at bay. So there's a composting toilet. One of the real concerns with float house living by the powers that be is that, well, you know, you're polluting the environment, which is kind of ironic because both the city of Victoria and the city of Tofino both dump their sewage straight into the sea. Um, and biologically, as a biologist, I don't think it would be a big deal, but um, it is important to, to make it look like you're looking after things. So this is professionally made in Ontario. It's by a company called Sunmar. You just crank the, uh, the handle, the barrel rotates, and uh, this is sphagnum bog, uh, peat moss. Once or twice a year, I just dump it out. Or actually, once every two years, it doesn't fill up very fast, um, just with me here but it's a, it's a great system. We've had weeks and weeks of time in the summer where there's no water, so I'm, um, I'll keep all the dishwater, um, not the, the soapy water, but all the rinse water, I save that, and then that becomes garden water. So this will just go through here, and there'll be a little trickle in a minute, and it goes back into the buckets. I had about five years when I had a pretty serious garden. I realized it ties you right down, and even though I did go away, I mean, all the hard work that I put in got wiped out a couple of times, because, you know, there's just a, a week of no rain, and all your um, kale dries up and your carrots dry up and your peas are all just little shriveled up things. It takes time away from my painting and I, I kind of realize maybe painting's probably a better thing to be doing. Yeah, so this is the interior of the floating house. It wasn't always as simple as this. I, um, it was only, you know, just the box and no second floor. I had to have a working space as well. So this stove was in the other corner and uh, I put in a skylight and I used to do all my painting right here and there's still evidence of it. If you look at the floor, there's lots of bits of paint all over the place. Um, hundreds of paintings got made right here under this little thing. These are golf cart batteries. Each one is six volts. And I'm not an expert on all this stuff, but I had help. Power comes in, there's the two solar panels outside. Maybe two or three times a year, I've got to crank up my generator and charge the batteries. It comes into this box here and I can tell it's charging pretty nicely right now. That little green light tells me roughly how much power is coming in. So that comes through here. This little blue box is an inverter. You could run a computer on this and you wouldn't have any um, spikes and things like that. So almost every light on the lower floor is 12 volts and everything upstairs is 120. This is fresh water. Quite often I get little stickleback and crayfish and things and just from the local ponds and I keep them for a few days and then if I'm going to go away for a while um, I often let them go. Um, but in this case um, I've got a little red-legged frog who's on his eighth year. Yeah. <laughs> so he was a little wee guy when he started but he's usually in here and goes quite easily without food for a couple of months at a time. The very first night I spent in this float house there were four wolves on the shore here. The wolves started howling and I was just blown away. It was uh, about five o'clock in the evening in November. And uh, I just thought, this is the coolest thing. I better write this down. And so I've been keeping pretty well daily records ever since 1991. And uh, it takes roughly six months to fill up one of these little notebooks, usually filling in four or five uh, pages a day. All this material gets computerized and uh, it's collected all over the province and uh, having a few people in key spots uh, really helps. And I, I'm just really lucky because not very many people get to live in one place in the natural world as consistently as this. It's funny, I hate leaving for that reason. It's like I'm missing a chapter in a good movie or something. 
Big highlight of uh, 2016 was getting this hot water system. Down near Duncan, there was a scrap metal yard. And I came across this beautiful old copper tank and I thought it was in pretty good shape until I set it up and then I had to take it back to Port Alberni and get it re-welded. So there's lots of time there, but uh, the cold water comes into the, the tube through the lower one. It heats up, expands, and then creates a convection current. So that then travels across the roof and then we could go have a look at the bathroom. <laughs> And it's not very fancy, but it sure works. Yeah. So this is your standard shower, and we can just turn it on to show off that it does work. There we go. Just leave that a second and we'll get lots of hot water. <laughs> and then there's another tank that provides the cold. It's just a typical little bathroom, but it makes all the difference. And then I've got a hole in the floor. We should have a look at that. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, fascinated by what's going on in the marine world and the easiest way to keep track of it is to just have a hole in your floor and when you got a float house you got your own aquarium right here occasionally there's been otters under the, the float and what's really fun is you just open up the flap and occasionally they go zipping by everything came eventually this was a just was on the notice board at the co-op um propane stove for sale so i paid 200 bucks and brought it up here and it took a long time to find a um a propane fridge this is a really nice little fridge um they're often found in campers but there must be quite a demand for them because uh, i was you know on the second hand business for looking for one for a long time this is a Berkey uh, water filter <laughs> and they're pretty handy they're simple as can be you just fill them with water and then there's um little uh, filtration uh, columns and then it slowly with gravity just drips to the bottom. You know, it's been good to uh, separate the um, the living quarters from the the artwork quarters and now that there's the second floor um, it works out really well. So the upstairs is entirely the studio and we should go and have a look up there. This is the, uh, the nerve center of the art world right here. Um, it's sort of evolved. This is a really nice light given to me by an artist friend. It's uh, true to um, the outdoor spectrum apparently and uh, it gets lots of use. It's over top of my palette and it's always interesting. You need light on your palette and you need light on your, your canvas and uh, in order to get the right colors. So this little area is where I, I usually mix and when I'm working in acrylics or oils I'm right-handed so this bench is on the right hand side and I have the, the easel that you see is just here and it's around here and then of course there's the stereo system and then and this is mostly acrylic paints and then I've got containers of oil paints. I spent so many hours in front of an easel with paint drying about four inches from my nose I picked up a bit of a quite a serious allergy of some kind to the acrylic paint and I think it's the ammonia in the acrylics so in order to um, help paint with acrylics and suck away the fumes, I created this little thing. So it clips onto the canvas and then there's a little switch here and that sucks the, uh, sucks the fumes out. But I, to be honest, it didn't really make a big difference. I often wear a respirator at the time, but uh, anyway, it was an experiment. Looks pretty fancy, very high tech. <laughs> well, for me, it's high tech, but that's, that's what that does. I used to teach high school. I was a biologist. Loved teaching once I was teaching, once I was in there. But the last week of August into the first few days of September, when there was the last little bit of freedom of the summer holiday, oh, I would just go nuts inside. Anybody that has a passion, I think you'd make yourself sick if you don't deal with it. And my grandmother, she was extremely artistic and she started painting very late in her life. The work just went better and better and better. And, and then in five years she died. And I thought, oh my God, the last thing I want to do is start my art career when I retire or even that late in life. And I wasn't sure I could make a living at it. And it didn't really matter that I made a living at it, but I really wanted to know if I could do that. And so I guess if you are a person that has that passion, and it doesn't have to be painting, but it could be writing, it could be music, um, you know, don't put it off to your late years. Once you stick your neck out, the pieces will fall into place and they will totally fall into place. And I've learned to just trust that. You make a decision that makes just a little bit more sense. And sometimes it's not obvious at the time, but this one looks like it might get me a little closer to that goal. And you make that decision. Then a few months later, weeks later, something else comes up and you make another little decision. You don't get there quickly, but you just creep along and then you look back and oh my god this is how it works and it's yeah a lot of us look back at our lives easier than we look forward you have no idea what's coming skin on my teeth was 
<laughs> Thank God it was thick enough a few times. Yeah, those first 10 years were tough financially for sure, but still, now I get to live the life I've dreamed of and I'm very lucky and I hope other people get to that someday. <laughs>